Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ashok and I'm presenting on Drupal Performance and Scalability. And just a little bit about myself, I'm a systems programmer who now works at the California Institute of the Arts. I've been working with Drupal since 2006 and I primarily help with patches and upgrades for contributed modules on Drupal. And of the ones that are listed up there, I'm the author of the abuse module, just for reference. And I have a strong interest in server optimization. And some of the resources and influences I've used for this presentation are Khaled Bahayeldin, who has written a lot of articles on his website at 2bits.com, uh, Constantin Kafer, who has written about front-end optimizations, and Steve Soders, who wrote the YSLOW extension for Firefox. And Drupal.org's infrastructure group is fantastic for learning more about their own setup and how you can use it to optimize your setup. And MySQL performance blog was essential for me learning more about database tuning. So the first things you want to do are define your goals. Do you want a faster response for your end user on each page? Do you want more page views? Or do you want to minimize downtime? Because even though they might be related, there's also a possibility that they're not. And each case is different. And the first things you can do are, there are usually easy, low-hanging fruit type of problems that are easy to, con to see, to diagnose, and to provide an improvement for. And you'll see huge improvements on your site. And as you spend more and more time on your site, or as it gets bigger and bigger, you'll have to put in more effort, and you'll get lower return. And what I mean by that is, you might need to put in more infrastructure, so you'll have to split your servers, uh, in having multiple web or database servers. You might have to patch Drupal. Or you might have to do revisions to architect to your architecture. So as an example, the CCK and views modules have gone through massive architecture changes. And in the same way, your site might go through a similar architecture change. And to go through all of that, you have to first diagnose the problem because it's essential before you start proposing and implementing a solution, or you're just running blind. You might think you're fixing a problem, but it might become worse, or you spend lots of time to essentially find out nothing has changed. So you have to analyze the data that you collect, and then that can lead towards a few possible paths of optimization. And two of the ones that I'll discuss during this presentation are regarding the front end, where I'll show some tools that you can use to measure and diagnose the issues. Uh, along with its speed optimizations, and server-side optimization, which is a much larger issue and has many more tools to diagnose and measure problematic areas, and speed optimizations for those. Um, if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about uh, things you can do with your modules as well. But that's, uh, let's just see how much time we have. So regarding the front end, most of 80% of the time, it's usually just with the loading of the images, the style sheets, and the JavaScript on your site that can account for perceived slowdown. So it might not be affecting your back end at all. It might be all in your front end. So as you can see, um, this little block is how big HTML might be, whereas these larger blocks are just how much the external components are taking over for your site download. So it can lead to a larger load time for the page. It can be an increase in the page size. It could be the number of rules that are being processed in your CSS that is slowing the site down. And similarly with JavaScript, if there's a lot of JavaScript and if there's a lot of code, of a lot of HTML code, the rendering might be taking a longer time. So some tools to measure and diagnose those. The easiest one you can use is Firebug's net panel. So just to give an idea of what it looks like for the Drupal Camp LA site. This is Firebug for anyone that has not used it. And there's a tab here called Net. And now, it's, now that it's activated, when I refresh the site, it'll show me everything that's downloading on the page along with how long it's taken to download each of these components. And as you can see, there are lots of components on the page accounting for almost a meg worth of download. Oops. 
another module that you can use which extends Firebug is called YSlow. And it rates a web page based on uh, 13 different criteria. It can help determine your overall load times, and it will provide some optimization suggestions as well. And there are good graphs and figures on it to show you just how much the different components of your site, uh, the, or weight, it accounts for the size of your web page. So this is why slow. And when I run the test and refresh the page, whoops. The first thing it'll do is give a ranking. And don't mind the ranking in the page of the site. Um, and it'll give some suggestions, such as making fewer HTTP requests or using a content delivery network. And in terms of the graphs that I was talking about, if you go to statistics, this is where it shows the total weight of the page along with where, which components were accounting for the most weight of that page. So in this case, the images accounted for nearly half the size of the page. And then similar to YSlow, there's Google PageSpeed. And the good thing about PageSpeed is that it provides improvements you can make to your CSS. So it might say these are rules you're not using on your page. And these are rules that are really inefficient. So if you take, those, if you take the advice of those, it, it can bring the size of your CSS down and it can make your page load faster. Um, there's also a new uh, project being worked on by Steve Soders. It's called Episodes and it measures timing for web applications. It's much more granular so you can actually see how long each component on your site or each section of your site takes to uh, render. And now there's also a Drupal module which you could use on your site. Uh, some non-browser related tools, so tools that you don't necessarily need to download, are AOL's own page test, which is very handy. There's IBM's page detailer. Uh, Pingdom has a couple of tools as well. And the good thing about them are they all provide a waterfall type of diagram. So it's very similar to how Fire, Firebug shows in its net browser. But it provides other statistics as well. And now we go on to optimizations based off what they suggest. So the first thing you can do is reduce the number of requests. Because for every file that, it, that needs to be requested from your server, it, it, produces, it produces an HTTP request. And the fewer requests that you have for your site, it's better than having smaller fi sized files. Because currently, most browsers can download at least two com components from your host at the same time. So if you have multiple small files, you might be downloading a large chunk of them in a sequence, one by one. Whereas if you have larger files, you might be having them download in parallel with the other set of large files that you have. And going on that, uh, if you have lots of images on your site, it might be worthwhile to combine your image sprites together and just shift the view for them via CSS. As an example, Google uses uh, Google uses a lot of images on their site, or what are perceived to be many images. But it's in fact one large image, which they then use CSS rules with to, for as, as an example, show this button, or this button, or the smaller size logo. Uh, you can also aggregate all of your scripts and your style sheets into one file each. And the good thing about Drupal is that it's already built in. But if you wanted more sophisticated uh, style aggregation, you could use some contributed modules such as SF ca um, system file caching or the JavaScript aggregator, which actually minifies the JavaScript that you have as well. Uh, more intense things that you could do are um, you can use CSS instead of images, which, which is always a very handy thing to do. Or you can use image data within your CSS file. So as opposed to using, downloading an image, it's all within your CSS file looking like data. Uh, the second option that you have is you can use a content delivery network. And the idea behind those is uh, are that there are lots of servers scattered around the world. So um, if I'm in LA, there'll be a server fairly close to me, maybe in LA or somewhere close by. Or if I'm in Toronto, 
there might be a server in Hamilton or in Ottawa. And this reduces the round trip times. So the client actually gets the content faster. And just as, a, just as an example, using a content delivery network on a site that I had built, ZimmerTwins.ca, increased our request per second by 30% from 150 requests to 200. So it can make a very big difference on your site. And it can be inexpensive. It could be from seven cents per gigabyte up to 80 cents. Uh, you just have to look around. You can also enable caching of these, uh, of these other types of content on your site. Um, as an example, if you had caching disabled, for every request being performed from the client on your server, it would query it and it would have to retrieve it again. And by default, what a client will do is it'll ask the server if the content is still fresh or if it's not expired. And if it's not, then it'll just serve it locally. Otherwise, it'll download it from the server. And more aggressive forms are, doesn't matter if it's expired or not, just continue serving the cache content that's on my, on, within my own uh, computer. And typically, it's controlled by the HTTP headers on your server. And that's how the browsers will check if the content is fresh. And what you can do is you can, as an example, if you have a CSS directory, you can set the expires header for that really far in the future. So in this example, if it's within the CSS directory, I turn on the expires header. And uh, by default, I let it be one year after the first time the person accesses that content. And you can even set it by, uh, by content type. So if it's a ping image, uh, set its uh, expiry date to be one year after it's first accessed. The only downside would be that you would have to change your file names when you update the content for those images or style sheets, or the user will be seeing old, uh, old content. Uh, you can also compress the text content on your site. So anything that's in a CSS file or in a JavaScript, just crunch it up. It can reduce the page size by a, a very big amount. And when I used it on the CalArts website, the zip con zipping the content made the page size go down from 250 kilobytes to 100 kilobytes. So it's a big difference. It frees up your server. It's, it's good all around. And you can, as I mentioned, you can compress scripts and styles as well. Uh, you typically want to put your CSS within the head tags of your file because what happens is that the page renders when all the CSS in the header is loaded. So if you have CSS content outside of that, uh, you, the user might see a little bit, a moment where some of the content might be unstyled or not looking the way you want it to look. And that's not a good thing. And you also want to use the link tags as opposed to add import. And the reason for that is um, using link tags supports downloads of multiple CSS files in parallel. And the link that's here talks more about that. And I'll be linking to, these, to this PowerPoint slides on the main page as well, so you have all of the links there. Uh, it's recommended to put your JavaScript at the bottom, typically right before the ending of the body tag. Uh, because uh, loading up the scripts blocks uh, the parallel load downloading of all the styles that you would have. And it would only allow one script to be downloaded at a time. So it'll slow down the site. And typically scripts are loaded sequentially. And you don't want to use event handlers right within your HTML code. Or that can also slow it down or maybe even break the site. Uh, you always want to have it gracefully degrade down. You can minify your CSS or your JavaScript. And what that does is it removes comments and white space from all the JavaScript or CSS that you would have. So has anyone seen what uh, the jQuery file looks like in, uh, on Drupal.org? It's very tiny. It looks like there are one-letter numberings. In fact, let me show that. If I view the page source and I look at the jQuery, this is everything. And it, it essentially looks like gibberish, but it's all compressed gibberish. 
and that can bring down the size of the page as well. It can be really big savings even with zipping up the content. And Drupal's core aggregator does not do minifying of the files, but there are contributed modules that do that for you. As an example, the JavaScript aggregator that I talked about before will minify your JavaScript files. Um, this is just talking more about the parallelization that I, I mentioned before. Um, the typical ruling is that uh, browsers should not allow more than two requests per host in parallel. But that rule has basically been broken by nearly all current browsers. As an example, Chrome, Firefox, IE, they all allow up to six parallel downloads at a time. And Safari and Opera, they allow four. So, you know, you're still able to get a lot of parallel downloads. But if you can, you should use multiple host names because it'll allow you to download twice as many files. So as opposed to being six, you'd be able to have 12 or more. Um, you can also reduce the image download size. Typically on, on sites, you will see that when they have their header images or their footer images, they might not be fully optimized. Uh, you can use OptiPing or PNG Crush, which will remove some of that invisible content, and it's all lossless decompression, so the user won't notice any difference. Uh, you can also use JPEG Transition or ImageMagic for JPEG operations, and YSlow actually has a plugin called Smushit, which will do all of this for you. And the Google page speed also reports on how much your image can be compressed. So to give an idea, there was one image on a site that I was working on, and the, file, the size of that file was approximately 250 kilobytes. And when I ran it through the Google PageSpeed reports, it told me I could compress it down to about 75 kilobytes, and no one would notice a difference. So it's big savings. And if you're using image cache for user-submitted content on your site, you're already doing a really good job. It's compressing it for you, and it's removing some of the invisible content as well. So the size of those files are already optimized. Um, persistent HTTP. So HTTP supports persistent connections. And what this means is that, let's say it was disabled on your site. For every request that would happen on the page, the client would need to open a connection with the server, and after it was done, it would need to close it. And that takes time. Uh, by having a persistent connection, it can simply keep querying the server because the connection is open and then close it at the end of it. So the east, it's a very easy setting. You just have to make sure the keep alive is not turned off on your server. Um, there's, al there's also lazy initialization. And the idea behind that is, well, JavaScript takes some time to initialize, and libraries like jQuery also count. So you can defer some of the setup work and load images only when you need to show them on the page. So let's say you have an image carousel on your site, and there are all these other images that are not being displayed yet. Only when, they're, when they need to be displayed, you can call on them to be downloaded. So to give an idea, I use this concept on, our, on some rework that I'm doing for the CalArts site. And initially, the size for that entire page for the images was 650 kilobytes. After I used the uh, lazy load mechanism, I got the initial download size down to 250 kilobytes. It'll still be 650 kilobytes in the end, but it's so gradual and slow that the user won't notice a difference. And there's a plugin that will only load content that you have above the fold. So once you start down, scrolling down on the page, that's when it'll start loading more and more images on your site. So it's very useful for sites that have lots of images. And other small optimizations that you can do, which I'd honestly not recommend, it, it's very low return on your value. Um, you can move components to a cookie list host. You can remove expiry tags, and you can change the load order of some of the images or scripts that you have. But you only want to use 
these if you have optimized everything else and there's nothing else you can do for the front end and now we move on to the server it's as I'd mentioned right at the beginning it's much more complex um, there are many many more measurement and monitoring tools you have to worry about hardware and the whole LAMP stack which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP and you also have to worry about Drupal so it could be database queries, it could be modules, it could be caching. It, there are many different areas that you could go into. So to go about for this, you need to validate all these results on a test server. So as much as possible, you want to try and replicate your site onto a development server or onto your local machine with all the current data. And the backup and migrate module really help with that. Uh, once you recreate the site, uh, figure out a time difference ratio between the test and production server. So if your production server takes one second to load a page and your local machine takes four seconds, you have an idea that your local machine is going to be four times slower. And you can just start comparing through that. And with this, you can try and avoid the wild goose chase. So you're not heading down some incorrect path. So when we're looking at the LAMP stack, we're looking at, as I mentioned, uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Uh, most of this, what I'm going, well, most of what I'm going to be talking about will apply to BSD as well. And hopefully in the future I can talk about Windows, but I haven't tried using uh, Drupal on Windows. So I know Woody talked a lot about uh, Microsoft and its involvement with Drupal on Windows, but I can't help him this time, sorry. In terms of hardware, the type of hard what you have matters. So if you're using a dedicated server, it's probably going to be better than a virtual private server. And with respect to the cloud, I haven't used it yet. So hopefully someday. And for people that have used it, hopefully you can chime in on this. Uh, multiple cores are the norm. So if you have eight cores on your CPU, uh, on your processors, that's going to be better than four. And that's going to be better than two and it's going to be much better than a single processor. Uh, having lots of RAM on your server helps immensely because there's lots of caching that can happen in the file system and on your database. Um, putting all of these uh, portions or as an example having Apache running on one disk, having your database server running on another disk will help as well. And, but unfortunately if you have shared hosting you don't have control over this and you have much more limited resources and you have to be more creative. But if you did have multiple servers you could have one be a database server and you could have one be a web server or you could have multiple web servers and one database server and you can use a DNS round robin for the load balancing so it'll just call each one sequentially or at random or you can use a proper load balancer that will check the load on each machine and then send it to the appropriate uh, server. Uh, you can use a reverse proxy which is like a HTTP accelerator so it won't even hit Apache uh, and that's what Drupal.org does. But you can only do this if you have the budget because complexity is expensive. Like you have running costs of the servers that you own, you have maintenance costs of all of these and you have lots of time that you have to put into each of these machines as well. So you'll have less time towards working to, on other things. And sometimes tuning a single system can avoid or delay splitting it up into separate machines. And I'll uh, talk about that on one of the sites I worked on as well. So some of the testing tools that you can use for your hardware and for some of your processes. Uh, you can use a tool called AB which stands for Apache Benchmark. And this line right here, AB-C50-N10,000, and there should be a website name here. What it means is that it will hit that website with 50 concurrent users at a time for up to 10,000 requests. And at the end of that, it'll give you what the average response time was for each user and how many requests it could handle per second. And the good thing is you can also test this with authenticated sessions. So you can test it as though you had authenticated users on your website because there are two very different problems to deal with. Um, there's also Siege, which is very similar in functionality to AB, but you can also test posting web forms with it. 
With both of these, you can't natively use it on Windows. So if you have a Windows machine, I'd recommend you use JMeter, which is a desktop application written in Java. It has a full GUI, you can do much more testing with it, and uh, it's much easier to use. Um, other tools that you can use are Top, which provides real-time monitoring, so you can see what your load averages on your website. You can see how much CPU is being utilized, along with memory, what processes are running. You can even change the order of your sorting and grouping and many, many other things, just to be able to get the data that you want. And HTOP is very similar to TOP, except it's for multiple cores. So if you have an eight core server, then HTOP would probably be the best option for you because it's faster and it has different colors and styles based on your processes. So uh, it'll be much easier for you to analyze that data. You can use ATOP, which is again very similar to the two mentioned before, but they're in slightly different format and information. Um, they show more network statistics and they have to run as an ongoing process in the background. So it's not like top where you can just call it up and it'll show you real-time statistics. This will show you what's going on in the background from before. Uh, you can also use VMstat, which reports on your memory statistics. So it'll show you how much free memory you have, how much you're using, all of that. And you can have it display in increments. So VMstat 5 would mean that it would show you what's happening every five seconds as opposed to every second or just at that time. Uh, Netstat will show you all the network connections on your site at the moment. Um, some graphical monitoring tools that you can use. Uh, the one I've used in the past and I still continue to use is Cacti. Uh, it's available as a package for Ubuntu and Debian, though I'm not sure uh, about other Linux and BSD uh, distributions. It has really easy to understand graphs. It displays a history over day, week, month, year, and the graphs can be available to display other statistics for for your CPU, memory, network, Apache, uh, your database, or even for memcached. And I remember finding this before. Just to give an idea, this is what Cacti looks like. Um, so it'll show you how many bytes were hit. It can show you different settings depending on your Apache or your bandwidth or the MySQL server that they have running, like the number of connections or how many files are open, what the traffic was like, or even for the memory. It's very easy to set up and I'd highly recommend it. Uh, Munin is very similar to Cacti, but you can also create monitoring scripts for it that can connect into your database server and give you other statistics with respect to Drupal. Um, there's another monitoring tool called Nagios, which I haven't used yet, but I've heard it is very powerful. Like You can get alerts by email or SMS if something happens to your server just through this. And there's also a Drupal module which integrates into it. So it'll give you statistics about your Drupal installation in much better detail than Munin might. Um, with respect to Linux or BSD, you want to use something that's, you want to use a distribution that's proven, that's stable. It's better to use something recent. Um, the best advice I'd give is use whatever distribution you or your staff are most comfortable with. Because if you're great at using Ubuntu, I wouldn't recommend using FreeBSD. They're completely different. Uh, you want to try and avoid bloat. So don't start installing PostgreSQL if you're using MySQL. There's no need to install Java if you're not using it. And you definitely don't want to make it into a desktop server. Um, you want to try and balance compiling your own programs versus using packages from the distribution. Because while compiling will provide you full control, and get you more out of a program, it can be a real pain to upgrade. But on the other side, while using packages are relatively painless, uh, you can only use whatever the latest version may be for that distribution. So I was using Red Hat Linux for the better, pa better part of 2007 and half of 2008, and I didn't have uh, 
uh, a PHP code optimizer available for it. I had to compile it um, uh, by hand. There was no other way around it. And with respect to Apache, it's popular, it's supported, it's feature rich, it's very stable. Most people use it. And it can also be enabled with too many unnecessary modules. And this can drastically drive up the size of each process that you have running for Apache. So I'd recommend disabling any unnecessary modules that you have. So mod proxy, the CGI module, they may not be necessary on your server and it's best to remove it. And smaller process basically means more users can come to your site. Uh, if you use the command apache ctl m, which is right here, it'll display all of the modules that are currently enabled on your site. So that'll give you an idea of which modules you can then disable from there. A tool that you can use uh, for monitoring Apache in better detail is Apache Top, which reads and analyzes the Apache access log for any of the sites that you may have. So it'll show all or all or the recent hits. It'll show the request per second, or and many other details. It's good to be able to detect crawlers with too. Uh, some Apache optimizations that you can do are, you can try tuning the max clients. Uh, this is a this is a setting you have to be careful with because if it's too low, you might not be able to serve enough clients, and they'll see. The, a screen that says server has exceeded client usage, which doesn't look very pretty. But if it's too high, you might run out of memory and your server will start trashing about. So it'll crash and then you can't serve any clients. So it's just, it's worse. Uh, you can also tune the max, maximum number of requests per child process. So typically you want to tune it to be able to run a few processes and then terminate after a while to free up some memory. Uh, you can use Keep Alive to keep a connection between the client and your server on for a little while, so it'll continue serving static files. And you should enable mod gzip or mod deflate, so it'll compress all of that CSS or JavaScript that you have on your site. Uh, some alternatives to using Apache are LightTPD and Nginx. Uh, LightTPD has been popular with Ruby on Rails. It's a lot lighter than Apache. But in the past, it's been known to have leaks. I'm not sure about its current, uh, about the current versions of Light TPD. But um, you can use Nginx, which is supposed to be much more stable than Lighty. It's a lot easier to set up, and the Drupal Camp LA guys are running this site using Nginx. So just to give an idea, uh, they both run PHP as a fast CGI process, which I'll talk about more. It's separate and it's uh, it's a lot leaner. You can also use Squid or Varnish, which are, like I mentioned before, HTTP accelerators. So what you do with this is you'd set it up as a front end to when the client comes to your site. And what will happen is that Squid will basically check if it can or cannot serve that content by itself. If it can, then the content will go right back to the user without having to go through Apache. And if not, then it'll query Apache. So you can use it for serving all of the data, all of the page content. Uh, you can use Apache for serving the page-related content, while you can use Squid for serving all of your media files. Um, it can serve anonymous page requests really well. Same with static files. It'll drive up the number of uh, requests you can use for your on your site really quickly. Um, but it can be a pain to set up, and it's used on Drupal.org. Um, now we move on to MySQL, which almost everyone I know uses that. It's not the best from a technological standpoint. It lacks some concurrency, but it still does a fairly good job. It's very easy to set up, and there are many pluggable engines for it. Uh, some tools that you can use to uh, analyze some of the data that you might have in MySQL are MTOP or MyTOP, which is very similar to TOP and it'll show all of the queries that are going on at the time on your server. So if something is holding down your site at that exact moment, you can type this in and you can see what that query was. And then you can start analyzing and trying to figure out 
what you can do about it. Um, two scripts that you can use to collect data and analyze it over time are MySQL report, which, uh, which collects all of the reports on the server regarding your setup and uh, what's going on with it. And while it won't provide any explicit recommendations, there's lots of documentation on the site which will, which will let you know about how you can tune your, server, tune your database server to be better. And two other scripts that you can use are MySQL Tuner, and there's one called Tuning Primer at the site uh, at day32.com. And while they are not as robust as MySQL Report, it, it provides actual recommendations that you could use for your MySQL settings. And it'll also provide warnings. So if something is not set correctly, it'll tell you that it's a bad idea. Or it'll let you know. Um, you can also use the slow query log, which can be enabled in the configurations for your uh, MySQL database. And it'll, it'll basically start logging any queries that take more than n number of seconds. So if it takes, if you can deem something to be slow, if it takes more than five seconds. And you can also list queries which don't have any indices. And it's very useful to identify potential bottlenecks. So the, one of the sites that I was working for it let me know that uh, using account query through the search module made the site crawl. And just removing it cut the search query and page render time in half. Um, there, it, the MySQL slow query log can be a little bit difficult to look at and analyze and digest, basically. So there's, one, there's, a, there's a script available, and there's a link for it as well. And some of the engines that you can use are MyISAM or InnoDB. Those are the two most popular ones people use. MyISAM is faster for reading. There's typically less overhead. And usually it runs fairly well right out of the box. But it has very poor concurrency. So you might have uh, table level locking happening on the site. So if multiple people are uh, trying to write to the database at the same time with the same query, it might start uh, falling apart. And with InnoDB, it has much better concurrency, but it is slower in some cases. As an example, if you do a count query, um, it's not as well suited right out of the box. There's much more tuning involved with uh, getting that up and running correctly. And there are other engines in development as well, such as Falcon and SolidDB, which are uh, looking fairly good so far in terms of their development. And for MySQL tuning, these are just the ones I've listed here are just some of the key ones that you might want to look into. So tuning the query cache and the key buffer are very important. Uh, the query cache will cache any queries that happen on your site. So if someone else calls it another time, it'll just fetch that data right away, as opposed to running that query against the database again. And the key buffer will keep a, will buffer up all of the indices that you have on your site. So having that at a larger value might be very useful. Um, the table cache is also important, because it caches your tables to be open. Uh, the sort buffer size, the read buffer size, relatively important. The temporary table size is quite important. It has to be the same or greater size than the query cache. So if you have your query cache to be very large, but your temporary table to be very small, your query cache is essentially as big as your temporary table. And with InnoDB, the most important parameter that you have is InnoDB buffer pool size. And you can set that to be a very large value if you have enough RAM for it. And most settings that I've seen, they recommend using 50 to 80 percent of the total memory you want to allocate towards MySQL. So if you have two gigs for a database server, they recommend one to one and a half gigs. And there are many, many more settings for it that you can uh, fine tune. And I found that MySQLPerformanceBlog.com is a fantastic resource for all of that. They have proper, they have full-fledged articles on discussing this issue in detail. Um, if you have multiple servers, you can 
pattern would be so that your master server would only do inserts, deletes, and update queries. And all of your select queries would go to the slave servers. And this is currently used on Drupal.org. And when we used this on ZimmerTwins.com, it dramatically sped up the site. And Drupal.org has also seen the same kind of improvements. Currently, it's not supported out of the box for Drupal 6, though there is a patch for it. But luckily, for anyone that's planning on developing sites for Drupal 7, it's already there. So at least you're future safe, uh, future proofed if you go with Drupal 7. But you have to be aware of any complexity because if anything happens between the connection of your master and slave, it could bring the site down or your data could get corrupted and again it could bring the site down. And if you tune your servers correctly, you might not even need those slave servers. So when we were starting to get these sorts of uh, corruption issues between our master and slave servers, I went back and find, I did extensive tuning on the database server. And I found noticeable improvements despite uh, not using the slave server. So we got rid of it, we got better performance, all, all for the price of one box as opposed to two. And with PHP, you want to use a recent stable release. Uh, Drupal 7 will require 5.2 and higher, and a few contributed modules for Drupal 6 also require have the same requirements. You will, I would highly recommend installing an opcode cacher or accelerator, such as APC or Xcache or Zend Optimizer if you want something commercial, because it's very useful in bringing down the memory usage for a site. And basically, if for anyone that doesn't know what an opcode cacher is, when a request is made, uh, when a PHP script is uh, executed, it's parsed, it's, uh, it is parsed through, and then it's compiled, and then it's run on you. And that can be very expensive. Um, by using an opcode cacher, it does the loading the first time and then it caches the results. So it's only doing the it's only doing the running part of it in the end. So you would see lowered memory usage, you would see a huge decrease in your CPU user utilization, and it could be the biggest impact on your site. For the Zimmer twins, the uh, memory consumption for each process went down from 20 megabytes to 4 megabytes. And when I used it on CalArts, it went down from 30 me 35 megabytes to 7. And a cache page would be even lower. It could be 2 megs or less. I've seen it at 500k. Um, 2 bits has written lots of comparisons between the three cachers at the URL I have here. There are some drawbacks in that it can crash once in a while. And it also might require restarts after you update your code. Um, the this by them folk have a Capistrano script that will that would be really useful for all of this. And opcode caching won't work in all circumstances. So if you have code that is going through data network connections, so if it's you know calling on the dig API or YouTube's API, or if it's uh, sorting arrays, or if it's doing database queries it's not going to work. And prior culprit modules have included Tagadelic and the node access modules and a few of the others that I've mentioned. But there have been problems in the past. I'm not sure about now. So if they're not problems anymore, I'm sorry. And if you're running PHP, uh, mod PHP is a standard module that most people use. That's what I use. Um, there's no state retained between the requests. There are few issues with it. It's really well supported, and the process size could be 10 to 12 megabytes, or even lower if you use the opcode cachers. But if you're not careful with it, it could easily be over 100 megabytes. So imagine having a 2 gigabyte machine and only being able to serve 20 people at a time. That's, that would be terrible. And this could all be because of how your Drupal modules might be cons configured and installed or the Apache modules that are enabled on the server. Uh, mod CGI used to be an old way of running PHP, but don't use it anymore. It's uh, very inefficient and just not a good idea. It's not secure as well. Uh, fast CGI 
is the successor to Mod CGI. It's much faster. It is used by Nginx and Light TPD. Uh, Apache also has a module for it. And Apache plus Fast CGI has been tested to be more stable with lower memory usage as well. But again, it requires some level of configuration and expertise with it. So if you don't have it, then there's no need to use it. And finally, we get to Drupal. It can be database intensive. It can be a CPU hog. It can be memory intensive. And there are modules that are known to be slow. And in some cases, uh, whatever, their whatever the bottlenecks of the module might be, they might not be what is affecting your site. So it can be a lot for you to process through. Um, as general maintenance tips, disable any modules that you're not using on your site. So if you have organic groups turned on, but you don't have any actual groups on your site, I'd recommend turning it off. You'll see a big improvement. And make sure cron runs regularly. This will keep your site refreshed and uh, um, running much better. Uh, tools that you can use to analyze some of this include the Devel module and Trace. And with the Devel module, it'll give you your total page execution time, uh, how long your queries take, how much memory is being used, and you can combine this with stress testing. And you can also log pages which use uh, a large number of queries or which take a long time to generate. So just as an example, Remember. So as an example, when I have the Devel module turned on, for this page, it'll show me just how many queries were executed for it and along with what the queries were and where it came from. And right at the end, it'll show me how much memory was used. Uh, right when it initialized, it was at 0.8 megs. And when it shut down, it was at 7 megs. And now it shows at 2 megs. So it, that lets me know that the opcode cacher is working. And it also shows how long it took to render all of that. So it took 96 uh, milliseconds from the back end. Um, some possibilities of problems that the module might have include doing calls over the network. So does your module do interesting things? Like it might be emailing lots of users. So as an example on groups.drupal.org there might be as many there might be as many as 2,000 users on a particular group and, if, and this used to be an issue in the past where if someone created content it would email all of those 2,000 users right away and this would put a lot of uh, uh, stress on the server. On the other side, you might have modules that call web widgets or APIs. So if it's calling Dig or YouTube or Flickr, uh, someone had made a module that called on Flickr to get all of the images and collections for a user. And he didn't cache any of that data. And it took over 20 seconds to render that one page each time. So you want to cache your data as much as possible. And this is for the web widgets and APIs. And if you're doing something like emailing users, there are lots of helper modules that can help with this. So the job queue and the queue mail module, they'll only send a certain amount of mail at a given time. Or you can offload all of this to a service that specializes with it, uh, such as mailing list. Or you can use the SMTP mail module, where you can tell tell it to use the Google SMTP servers with your username and uh, password or whatever to send all of this data. It can help speed up the site immensely. Um, if you're using page caching, uh, it's very good for your anonymous users. It doesn't necessarily affect your authenticated users, but you can also set the uh, minimum cache expiry time. So you can have a page be fresh for an hour, for five minutes, or for eternity. And you can also turn on aggressive caching, which is in Drupal. 
And while it's not compatible with all the modules, for example, it's not a compatible with the statistics module, it can provide better performance. Um, other types of caching that are not necessarily turned off include the filter, the menu, blocks, and forms. Um, a very useful Drupal caching module that you can use for your anonymous users is Boost. And for anyone that's not, for uh, to get an idea of what it does is it creates HTML for all your pages and stores it into files. And so what will happen is that when someone does a page request, your HT access file will directly send the content from those files as opposed to running all of those PHP scripts that you might have. Um, it's usable on your shared hosts as well as VPS and on dedicated servers and it can enhance the ability to handle traffic spikes from anonymous users. It's, it's very useful. Um, Development Seed had a case study on using Boost for its anti-poverty event site and they had performance gains by nearly a thousand times. They were able to serve a million pages a day with no problem. You can use the cache router module as well. Um, the good thing about the cache router module between those three that I've listed is that you can specify your cache to go to different types of caching uh, methods. So as an example, you could have your pages cached to a file. You could have your forms cached to the database. And you could have, by default, uh, have make the cache go into a memcache bin. So you can have all of these different caching uh, processes deferred about. And it's uh, very stable. Um, and all of this is enabled by Drupal's ability to have pluggable caching. So in your settings.php file, you can actually change what type of caching uh, Drupal will run for your site. So you can create your own custom module if you have some brand new uh, best of way to cache all that content. Or you can even use it to disable caching. Though I really wouldn't recommend it for a production site. It'll, it'll really bring it down. Uh, if you use memcached, it's, uh, it's basically a way of storing your content in memory across multiple servers. This was written by Danga for a live journal when they had a need for it. And as I mentioned, it can span multiple servers. So you could have one really beefy machine that serves all your PHP content, and you could have a whole series of really uh, slow machines that have lots of RAM on them serving all of this cached content. And it's seamless for Drupal 6, uh, though Drupal 5 requires a patch plus some database changes. But it can lower your database queries in half, uh, or more. It has its own requirements, uh, and in that I mean Apache needs to be restarted any time you restart memcached. And adding more insta instances means there, are go there is going to be more complexity. Because um, each content for each site requires some sort of key that it can hash all of this content, all of this cache content into. Um, you can also change the search mechanism. That's probably the biggest thing you can do for your site. Because Drupal core search is all right, I guess. Um, as you start getting more and more content on your site, it's, uh, it's not going to get any easier. Uh, even the database tuning can go so far. Uh, to give an idea, for the Zimmer Twin site, there are a million nodes. And if we use the core search on that, it would take more than 30 seconds before we'd get any results back. So you can try another engine. You could use Sphinx, um, which can install on top of MySQL or PostgreSQL. Um, it's used on nowpublic.com. And um, according to uh, CHX, uh, as people might know on Drupal.org, it's the best thing he's ever used. And he's been disappointed in a lot of things over the course of his life. <laughs> and it's available as a Drupal module. Uh, you can also use Apache Solar, which is very fast. It can be a little bit painful to configure, though we're talking with another person from Pingvision today. He said that the process has become much easier. 
but it's available as a Drupal module and on top of that Acquia offers it as a service in their setup so you don't have to set up Apache Solar on your servers or do anything with it if you have a subscription with Acquia they'll handle it for you it makes it very seamless uh, another way to go with it is uh, using Google's custom search engine it works better than uh, Drupal's own search uh, on the site and other options that you can use are um, companies have started coming out with their own optimized distributions of Drupal now um, Fork Kitchens has released a distribution of Drupal called Pressflow and the good thing about that it supports uh, database replication right out of the box it only supports MySQL and you might view it as a bad thing if you use PostgreSQL or if you want to have that sort of database uh, uh, compatibility but most of the time people are using MySQL and in that case by only supporting that uh, they're able to optimize the code a lot more it cleanly supports reverse proxies such as squid and varnish that I mentioned before and it's optimized for PHP 5 so you could have your site running really fast and more recently um, let me remember the name of the company uh, chapter 3 released a build based on Pressflow called Mercury and it's basically an Amazon machine image to be used on an instance of uh, Amazon in the clouds and what they've and in addition to all of the things that Pressflow does they've patched cache router to be able to use the other caching mechanisms they've tuned their Apache settings and from what I've seen on their site the results look very promising so this could be an option that you could use for your cloud services. Um, the only downside is, if they don't support it in the future, then you're kind of host. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yes? So I was just wondering, like, why would they have to patch to use APC? APC is a, is a huge, huge I What I meant is they patched the cache router module. To use it with APC. Okay, so this is like a whole land, here's your server, land stack. Exactly. It's everything in the box. And other options? Well, you can patch Drupal. Uh, it's known by another name, which is Hacking Core. I really wouldn't recommend it unless you know what you're doing, but sometimes it is necessary. And just to give an idea, Pressflow has patched core and Drupal.org has a patched version of Drupal. So if you are going to make these changes, you should do it from a safe distance. So if you're going to be changing one of the core modules, I would suggest copying that module into sites and uh, sites slash all slash modules, then applying your changes there. So in that case, you're only overriding the core module. You're not explicitly changing the original one. Um, you can use pluggable caching to have your own version of caching. So as opposed to making all of your changes into that cache include file, well, roll your own. If you're going to be doing schema changes, I'd recommend doing that in a separate module so you can remove them cleanly in the future. And if something is being run through the form rendering, on Drupal.org, I'd recommend, again, creating your own module and overriding the original mechanism so you can change the, valid, change the submission or validation to point to yours. And most importantly, have an easy way to track the changes you've made. So if you have it all in subversion, at least this way you can uh, cleanly check what changes you've made between the core version and the, uh, the override version that you have. Um, just as cases where I've had to patch Drupal. Um, on the Zimmer Twins site, the user login was extremely slow. And by that I mean when someone tried to log in, it would take five seconds. And, well, one big reason for this is that the site was fairly big. It had around half a million users. But the main problem was that the database was not using the index on the username. Because by default, um, I can type in my name as BT Mash with a capital B 
or with the lowercase b. And Drupal will typically convert it all into lowercase so it can match all the possible patterns. And because I wasn't using the index, the site was becoming slower. And there's an original issue of all of this on Drupal.org, and it's been around since 2006, and it's still an ongoing issue going into Drupal 7. Um, my solution was modifying the patch that was on within that patch issue of the site. I copied the user module into sites all modules to override that code and now the user login time is less than 0.1 seconds. And just to give an idea, as I'd mentioned, Drupal.org has been patched as well. So now your login has to match the exact case that you registered onto the site with. So I'm still getting confused when I type in BT mash all in lowercase and I can't log in. Uh, the second case is uh, comments don't have an index on the user ID. And this was a problem with my own module, the abuse module, because uh, I actually do some queries based on uh, getting, user con getting comments based on the user ID. So my solution was to create an index for it, but I didn't want to roll it into the user's uh, updates, uh, into the user's install file, sorry. So I added that update to my module and so that when I uninstall it in the future or when I create an update, I can easily remove that key should Drupal decide to add it in. And loading for comments on, by user on my site wasn't an issue anymore. And for module developers, um, just some words of advice. Uh, take advantage of caching. Uh, use memory wisely. So unset your variable if you don't have a need for it down the line. But on the other side, save the variable to your memory for future use so processing isn't done multiple times. So if you have an extensive filter going on, just save it into memory for the time being. I highly recommend taking advantage of jQuery and the uh, Ajax functionality that Drupal has because it will mean fewer queries. You're not reloading the page, so you're not serving all of those CSS and JavaScript files again, and you're just saving bandwidth in general. And that's it. Um, does anyone have any questions? So I have a last slide. You said save it in memory. So what I mean by that is that um, if that if that uh, content only needs to be saved for a temporary time just for that page, but it's being used multiple times. Just keep it in memory so that if someone else calls that function, you can just directly serve that content. So you're not doing all of that processing that would be involved for it. So as an example, let's say for a page I have, I'm just trying to think of a decent case scenario. Okay, a good example is the translate module. When someone requests a string, a database query is done for it, and then they deliver the content. But it'll, it'll also save that string in memory. So the next time that it's called for the page, it'll just serve that content as opposed to doing another database query. So it can help, uh, it can, like I mentioned, it can help with the processing of the page. Uh, if you have a new cache module, it's all pretty transparent that it's, it's going to be caching all these variables just intrinsically? Um, well, you would be only if you're use explicitly calling on caching if you're not if you're only serve if you're only saving this to static memory on your page obviously it's not going to memcached at that time but if you do db cache and then cache this content it could be going into memcached or to apc or whatever caching me mechanism that you have for your site um, yes I wouldn't actually. Uh, it it really depends. It depends on the size of your site, how it's growing, because the database tuning was the longest. It took me the longest time to understand and to 
have it fine-tuned for my site took a really long time because the, uh, the needs for the site kept changing as well. So I would honestly, I started off with the front page optimizations for, for a reason. Those are the easiest things to do and they could be the biggest things that uh, save your site. And then as you're going down the line, um, you know, I would, put my, I would put my SQL up there, but I would try the other things first. You really want to diagnose your problem first before you start diving into these sections, or you might just be wasting time. Uh, you had a question? Mm -hmm. um, right, so I would recommend turning on the Devel module and there's actually a uh, setting which lets you see what happens right after your form is submitted and you will be able to see what queries are happening on your page at that time. So I would recommend looking at that. Then you can see what queries are happening, if they're happening multiple times, and then uh, trying to resolve through that. Yes? Um, you know, also, uh, turn on slow queries log and yeah. see what it's showing. But uh, um, related to that, I was wondering, do people routinely use NLDE engine and for, for Drupal and that uh, yes, uh, Drupal.org uses InnoDB exclusively. And um, for the Zimmer Twin site, for everything except the search tables, I used InnoDB. And that was, uh, that was a big boost for our site. Is that because you were using full text indexing search stuff? Uh, to some extent. Um, like I would mentioned before, my ISM can be uh, really good for fetching results, not necessarily for updating and doing more concurrent levels of stuff. So by just uh, using my ISAM on our search indexes, we didn't have a need to put, convert it to InnoDB, and we still saw decent performance. Okay. Yeah. What about a MySQL proxy server? I know it's in beta right now, but with MySQL proxy server, it's going to be uh, I remember looking into it a long time ago. I don't know where it's at at this point. But again, it comes down to if you have multiple servers, then um, it might be a good way to go for it. And it might... Oh, sorry. Uh, the question that was asked is um, MySQL actually has a tool called MySQL Proxy. And would that be useful for, uh, I guess, replication? Um, it could be. It's, it's definitely a potential tool to be used. But what you'll have to do is you'll have to tune your own PHP settings to take advantage of it as well. So you'd have to still specify what the master server is, when it can be used, and when it can use the slave servers on your site. And while Drupal 7 will solve a chunk of that, Drupal 6 doesn't. And most people in this room are using Drupal 6 or Drupal 5 or uh, previous versions. So you'll still have to patch it to take advantage of that kind of setup. But I can definitely see it making it easier to replicate your content on the site. Easier than the people Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes? You mentioned that this is an HTTP setting for Is that in uh, that's, it's either an Apache con for httpd.com and it's not um, persistent connections, it's called keep alive. Uh, yes? Can you or anyone else recommend um, performance monitoring on, on the Drupal site? Um, so things like, uh, if you notice the site's slow, whether or not it's because the site's being hammered by you know, tens of thousands of users at a particular moment, um, and if so, how, how many people are doing that? I would recommend, well, uh, I'd mentioned a tool called Cacti and Munin before, which can track how some of these processes are performing on your site. 
and it'll log all of this data for you so you can go back at it and if someone does hammer your site, you can start taking a look at what was happening at that time. So if you start noticing that it's an Apache spike that occurred, maybe that's something you, you, look, you need to look into. Or it might be with MySQL. And then it can really help narrow down. Oh, I was second that. Even, uh, I go for a site where we were going to hammer it in. If we hadn't had the unit, because um, everybody was uh, theory crafting why we were having problems, and just about everybody was wrong. Mm -hmm. And we only found that out because the union graphs showed us it was a networking problem. So it's an awesome tool. Yeah. And um, I don't know if I showed it before. Actually, I think I did. But this is what Cacti looks like, and these are the graphs that it provides. So if I clicked on it, um, it'll show me what the day usage was here, the week, or remember, for the day, for the week, for the month, and for the year. And if I click on this zooming tool here, I can actually select a region as well. So I can go into more detail about what's happening at a given time. Will it show things like the anonymous versus login users? Uh, you can have it show all of that sort of information as well. Uh, typically, Nagios is better for something like that, or at least that's what I've heard, especially since it integrates better into Drupal. Yes? It could be an issue, oh sorry, did everyone hear the question? Um, I think the question that was asked is um, if, there, if you find a slow query and the source is the CCK module, do you need to modify the CCK module? Uh, I would recommend filing it as an issue on Drupal.org first because there might be more people that can tackle that issue along with yourself and it could be patched for everyone else to use as well. Pardon? Or yes, or it might be already reported and you could try that patch out on your development box. Yes? Um, it'll, it'll be unlikely that the uh, CCK would be involved in the um, Right. I'm surprised to hear it. Um, looking into the view and changing it or really exporting it mm -hmm. and uh, you know, editing it as an export. Um, if all else fails, write your own custom module with your own custom query and deem the output. Um, you know, that, that's, that's still doable. We don't have to use the view interface. If there's some use case where it just generates some graphic code and graphic queries, it blocks the system down. Absolutely. Um, and to give an idea as well, for the Zimmer Twin site, we didn't use views for that explicit reason. Um, while views might give us good queries, we knew what the indices were for our pages. We had our own custom databases for all of this. So it just made sense for us to write our own queries. It was much, much faster that way. Uh, any other questions? On your site, at what point how many users or, or visitors, at what point was it that you guys realized that Um, once we reach the 100,000 user mark, we were starting to notice some level of uh, degradation on our site. And the biggest uh, hit that we saw was actually with the caching tables. Uh, because everything was in my ISAM at the time, uh, we constantly see corrupted uh, data or just conflicts happening in the database. And people would get bad pages, so to speak. So. Um, at the time, I used a patch to, uh, uh, to take advantage of what MySQL does and just replace the content if it's the exact same thing being called. And that solved the issue. But that's when we started concentrating on either patching Drupal or starting to tune the server. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Quite a bit. 